Good morning. For those who don't know, my name's uh, Rory Goodson. I'm one of the um, practitioners at King's Chambers in the business and property team, um, having been here for a couple of years now. Um, today, I'm going to be taking you through the question of payment of, of judgment by instalments and the attaining um, and um, enforcement of orders of variation of those um those judgments i i appreciate that for uh, when uh, thursday morning going so deep into procedural rules may not be the world's uh, most exciting topic but hopefully we can garner some some interest from it because it is i think something that is very useful to be aware of and have a have a good knowledge of we'll be dealing with this in in, in three distinct parts the first of which is the question of of payment of judgment by instalments itself um, this is obviously a highly relevant topic. Almost all litigation ends up in some money judgment of, of some kind upon orders being made. And certainly in my experience, it is extremely common for a judgment debtor to immediately raise the question of being granted a longer period of time to pay. The questions that the court will ask in assessing that um are obviously therefore highly relevant to anyone involved in in that kind of litigation. After that, we'll move on to varying orders made in the High Court under one of the case management provisions. And then finally, I'll be moving on to Rule 40.9a, which sets out a, a distinct and a fairly um, complex procedure that only applies in the county court to varying judgments and orders made there. Um, and we'll be looking at some of the, the case law that applies in relation to these three various parts along the way. As I'm sure you're all aware, um, Rule 40.11, the standard period for payment of, of judgment debt is 14 days. There's no requirement within that rule that an order make provision for time for payment but if it doesn't then that automatic period of 14 days applies there is within rule 40.11 a the power to the court to order payment at a different period of time and to specify a longer period of time for payment and that can also be by installments I've noted there the existence of practice direction 40B, paragraph 12. It's not of um, necessarily particularly high importance, but it is, I think, worth mentioning because within that it sets out exactly what an order for payment by instalments um, has to include. It's the things that you would expect, the amount of the judgment, the amount of each instalment, the number of the instalments, and to whom they have to be paid. But it's worth just pointing out that all of those elements have to be included within that order for that to be a valid one. In terms of uh, requests to pay by instalments, there is some limited authority on how the courts will deal with this approach um, and to this question under Rule 40.11. I've got a couple of cases there that I'll just discuss briefly. The second of which related to um, payment by instalments after ad after some admissions under Rule fourteen point ten, but it's it, it, it's clear that the courts will take the same approach in relation to those two decisions. The overarching uh, point that I think can be taken through all of this is that uh, the emphasis is on the right of the judgment creditor to be paid within fourteen days. And the courts have shown a reticence to displace that um, entitlement within the within the litigation and within the case law that exists. In general, it should be left to the judgment creditor to decide how best to enforce the judgment to which he's entitled. And that's what we see in the um, Amsalem decision made very clear. In the case where the proposals put forward don't offer any uh, realistic prospect of substantial payment being made, the courts shouldn't 
um, accept any submissions in relation to extending time for payment. And the judgment creditor should be entitled to then seek to use the normal enforcement provisions as they see fit. I see there are a couple of points in the chat. Um, I'll try and deal with questions at, at the end. So if you could just and make a note of what they are, and then hopefully, if we've got time, we can, we, we can tackle those at the end. The second of these is 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 the Gulf International Bank decision. I think this is particular of particular interest um, for one of the points that he focuses on in relation to a common submission when um, extension of time or instalments are requested, which he relates to where there are other creditors of the judgment debtor and the way in which their interests might be affected. The court made the point that whereas that may be a consideration, ultimately there are the bankruptcy and winding up procedures and the insolvency procedures within the specialist courts that are specifically designed to deal with the competed interests of creditors. And so it's not for the courts when issuing judgments and making orders of this kind necessarily to engage in that process um, and that that should instead be be left to the to, to the insolvency courts to weigh up those interests in the manner set out within um, their legislation and their powers so that's the basic starting point when it comes to installments that's what the courts will be looking at ultimately there need to be exceptional circumstances shown variation of those orders um, when it comes to the high court as I said at the outset is different from the county court in that there isn't a standalone provision what there is is the general rule within the case management provisions at rule 3.17 entitling the court to vary or revoke any order that they've made and that is a, a very general power most often applied within or to procedural orders, but it can also apply in relation to into final orders, um, albeit the, the threshold for that is an extremely high one. The Court of Appeal decision in, in, in Tibbles and SIG um, dealt with the question of the, the, the power to vary these orders under 3.17, and it made some points that were uh, very important in terms of restraining the apparent breadth of the discretion that you can see on the face of that regulation. They noted there that while the, the power appears to be broad and unfettered, when it comes to a final order that is made by the court and attempts to vary that, the, ne the necessity of promoting finality and of allowing certainty of the parties is such that the threshold becomes a lot higher. They noted that there might be three circumstances in which orders could be affected or changed where they were final orders and they were challenged under that provision or sought to be altered under that provision. The first of which was where there had been a material change of circumstances since the order had been made. And clearly when it comes to an order by instalments um, or for later payment, that's the one that is most likely to be of relevance. The second was where the facts on which the original decision had been made had been misstated innocently or otherwise. And the third was where the, there had been a mistake on the, uh, by the judge in the formulation of that original order. But the emphasis was certainly placed on the fact that that provision shouldn't be used to vary a final order without there being significant new material that wasn't available when that first decision was made and when that first order was made. As I say, that decision wasn't specifically in relation to um, a, a, an order by instalments, but there is later authority which has applied those principles to the question of orders by instalments. And... Um, and their variation under 3.17. 3.17 being the only means by which those high court orders can be varied, um, those are the principles that would apply in those circumstances. And as you can see, the threshold is, is necessarily very high and plays back into what I was saying earlier 
about how the emphasis is always on the right of the judgment creditor to enforce um, his, his the monies and the debt owed to him in the absence of some very particular reason why that shouldn't be the case. That brings us to the county court and variations of orders within the county court. The provision here is Rule 40.9a. It is a very long and detailed provision of the civil procedure rules, and it provides for a number of different um, eventualities by which either the creditor or the debtor can seek to vary an order for payment within, um, w- within the county court proceedings. The first of these, as I noted there, and it, it's difficult to see um, a number of circumstances in which one may want to do this, but it's not inconceivable, in that a creditor can apply for an order to postpone the date for payment or to alter the date for payment by instalments. Um, and the court officer on receipt of such an application can make that order as requested. As I say, the reasons by which a claimant may be looking to delay their ability to enforce an order are are likely to be few, but that power nonetheless exists within the provision. More likely is that included at subparagraph 5 of that provision, which is that a creditor can apply to the district judge for a payment to be made at an earlier date than had previously been specified. So if it had been ordered to be paid in one sum at a later date, they can seek to have that brought forward. And if it was payable by instalments, they can seek for it either to be paid in one sum or in larger instalments. One can see how that is likely to be a more readily used provision in circumstances where if there's a long period of instalments ordered and circumstances have changed such that um, the creditor believes it's in their best interest to be able to enforce as soon as possible, you can see how um, an application under that provision may be made. um, And there's a provision there in terms of the evidence that needs to be supported in relation to making that application um, and and it then being listed, as I say, for, for determination before a district judge. One thing that's important to note within this provision is the distinction between something being determined by a court officer and some of them um, applications being referred directly to a district judge. That's going to become particularly important when we move to looking at debtors' applications um, to delay payment or, and to allow for payment by instalments. Subparagraph 8, as I note there, allows a debtor to apply for money if it's payable in one sum to be paid later and if it's already payable in instalments to be paid in smaller instalments. There's a prescribed form for the application. Um, It has to state the proposed terms on which they are intending to pay the judgment debt. It has to state the reasons why they ought to be entitled to pay at this more um, leisurely pace. And it also has to have appended to it a signed statement of the debtor's financial means, the basis of which they have put together their proposal for payment. Within 14 days of that then being sent by the court officer to the creditor, the creditor has to respond stating whether they object to the um, application for delayed payment or not and state the reasons for that. It's these next two provisions that are particularly interesting and slightly unusual. If there's no objection, the court officer will make the variation requested by the debtor. What's unusual and can result in some absurd outcomes is that if there is an objection, the court officer, rather than necessarily a judge, will simply assess and determine a new rate of payment um, of the judgment debt What prompted me in large part to give this talk is that I was involved in a case earlier this year in which the judgment debtor had lost a trial and owed a sum of just over £200,000, had made an application under this provision to the court officer um, 
seeking payment by instalments um, and saying that they were, had very limited means. This was objected to by the creditor and the court officer made an order stating that they were entitled to pay that debt at £700 a month, which, to do some quick maths, would suggest you know, hundreds of years or t- decades at least before that judgment debt would in any significant part be discharged. Of course, there is then provision for the judgment creditor to challenge that officer by the court order. And this is when the matter comes before a district judge who would determine the rate of payment and any variation from the original order. The point here is that they're not dealing with a challenge to the court officer's order. If it gets to this point, if the court officer's order is disputed, then the question is a challenge to the original order rather than to the court officer's variation, which is of some significance in the sense of on whom the burden lies to challenge the order as it alters who is challenging the order itself. The authority in relation to this point, or the most important authority, is the Court of Appeal decision in, in Lawson and, and Stack, where they considered the different um, threshold in challenging an order under 40.9a compared to challenging an order under 3.17. What's noted there is that the threshold of material change of circumstances doesn't apply. Part of the reason for this and part of the reason for making that observation is that if it did apply, there'd be no need for this separate provision within the county courts. The very existence of the separate provision within the county courts suggests that a different threshold is intended to be applied. What's also noted there and what I've quoted in full on the slide is that whilst the court can make such order as it thinks fit, the power does have to be exercised in a way which properly respects the rights of the judgment creditors which have been vindicated by the orders which the court has made in their favour. And this goes back again to the point that I highlighted earlier, that throughout all of this and overlying all of this, the emphasis that the courts have placed is on um, the entitlement of the judgment creditor to enforce their rights as set out within the original judgment. However, the court did say that where a debtor has presented a realistic payment schedule backed up by evidence that under which the court believes the creditor can be expected to receive the principal sum and interest within a reasonable period of time, then the court may be minded to allow the variation on the basis that the creditor's interests remain protected and also Um, the the likelihood of payment is in some ways increased. So that's the way that the courts have looked at it under 40.9a. It's clearly a slightly lower threshold for making those variations than we saw in relation to the high court um, challenges. But the emphasis is on the debtor to present that realistic payment proposal um, to provide sufficient evidence to show that or to suggest that the judgment creditor will receive the principal sum due and and any interest ordered. And of course, the interest is an important point where the judge, where the court is minded to delay payment or order instalments. They will also consider um, whether it is appropriate to order a sum of interest to apply in relation to that delayed period in order to compensate the judgment creditor for the delay in their ability to enforce the rights that they're entitled to under the original order. Those are the three elements that I said we, I wanted to look at in relation to this. Um, I, I've set out a, a couple of points in relation to each of those there. The general overlying theme, as I say, is that the... The strong, the strong position, as one would expect, lies with the judgment creditor. They have a right upon receiving their judgment to enforce it within 14 days. And the courts are reticent to interfere with that. Under 40.11, there'll be a general need to show exceptional circumstances as to why the period will be longer than 14 days. In my experience, those exceptional circumstances at the uh, conclusion of trial often don't 
appear to have to be that exceptional to allow a judgment debtor to be to pay within 21 or 28 days there's often very little objection to that from the creditor in any event when it comes to varying those high court orders as we saw there is a very high threshold in relation to that a manifest change of circumstances is likely to the, to be necessary and then the county court procedure under 40.9a it is a detailed procedure for the variation of orders it does include the possibility that a court officer can be making court, uh, can be making orders that provide for significant variation of the party's rights but there is a right to have it brought before a judge and the emphasis in that remains on protecting the entitlement of the judgment creditor to enforce his rights unless the debtor can put forward the um, convincing proposals um, that we saw within the Lawson and Stack case were um, considered by the court. I can see there are a couple of questions in the chat, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pop those open now. Will the slides and recording be available? Yes, they will. Um, I see William Miller, can it be a shorter period of time? What was that in relation to? the Under the county court procedure, as we saw, you can um, apply, the creditor can apply to have it enforceable in a shorter period of time. I don't see any reason why the court um, could not require a shorter period of time either. 4.11, uh, 40.11 in terms of time for payment simply states that the judgment or order can specify a different date for compliance. That doesn't suggest that it, it has to be longer than 14 days. So, so in, in theory, it, it could be shorter. Um, uh, it's more unlikely for those circumstances to occur, but I suppose it's not um, uh, not inconceivable. It, there's a question there in relation to um, interest uh, and whether if it's in installments over a period, is there provision for interest? That's something that ought to be put within the order for for the payment by instalments. Um where it's calculated over a year um, and the instalments are broken down over, say, 12 payments of one year, those uh, it, it, the value of each payment will, will need to be put within um, an order for the payment by instalments. As I noted within some of the um, authorities, the courts have been keen to stress that where there is payment over a longer period of time, it will be... Um, helpful or it will be uh, a strong consideration for the court to protect the creditor's rights by including um but but by including interest so i think it's it's something that should be in the order itself although i'm not aware of any specific provision requiring it to be so i've got a couple of questions here in terms of varying payment um terms in a consent order I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be possible. Certainly within the um, county court procedure, there's no reason why that wouldn't be possible because the parties both have an entitlement to apply and in the absence of any objection by the other party, that order will automatically be made. In terms of the, the high courts, I, I'm not aware of a specific provision in relation to it. I don't see any reason why a court would object if the parties agreed to vary time for payment. That would seem very unlikely, uh, an unlikely course for the court to take. The, what the courts have always emphasised is protecting the right of the judgment creditor. If the creditor is willing to have their payment timetable uh, delayed, then I don't see that the, the court would necessarily oppose that. Now, I've also got a question here on a substantial interim payment on account ordered following a high court trial. Will that amount to exceptional circumstances, i.e. for extra time? I assume that means um, for extra time in relation to uh, the, the remainder of the judgment. Um, quite possibly. Unfortunately, the authorities in relation to these are extremely fact-specific beyond drawing out a principle of exceptional circumstances, um, it, it, it's quite difficult to pin down a common thread. 
necessarily the parties involved in all of these things um, are, are, are drawing on different um, different circumstances and different points. I'm not aware of anything in relation to a substantial interim payment um, that, that I can that I can offer. I'm afraid. I think I've been through the questions now. Is there a time limit within which the creditor must apply to, to vary the payment order? N- not a specific one. Certainly not within the um, the, the county court provisions, um, unless it's made clear within the order itself. Um, obviously, you wouldn't be able to apply to vary it after the order's been uh, after the time for period has expired. I don't see any any reason why there would be a, a, a specific time limit, and there's certainly not one within the provisions that is set out. Well, thank you everyone for attending. I think that's been through all the questions that have been um, posed. I hope that was helpful it is a fairly dry topic as i said at the outset but i hope it's one that you've um gained some use from and um may may have been uh, of some interest and um yes i hope to see see you back at some of these in the future uh, this, as i said the slides and the recording will be made available um in the next couple of days